Hi everybody and welcome to First Draft. Um, tonight we are tackling the subject of cereals, so i um, really excited to do that and we are also sipping on our nice autumn pumpkin ales. So um, we are also just the three of us tonight, which is kind of um, fun for a change, but both um, Alexis and Julia have a lot of knowledge about cereals, so um, I am going to sit back and play the role of host and let them talk about what they know about cereals, and I'm sure I will learn some things, and hopefully you will as well. Uh, we will go around and introduce ourselves in case you're joining us for the first time tonight, um, and I will start with Alexis Ann. Hi, I'm Alexis Ann. I write uh, erotic and contemporary romance and cereals for fun, and tonight I'm actually not drinking pumpkin. I'm drinking the Sam Adams Oktoberfest because I, ha I don't like pumpkin. <laughs> no, I don't like pumpkin beer either. <laughs> no! Perfection. Sorry, don't like pumpkin and spice many things, except pumpkin. No. <laughs> All right, Julia, um, even though you don't so, like pumpkin beer, I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> I know, it's one of my flaws. Um, so I'm Julia Kelly, and under that name I write uh, both historical and contemporary romance, and then I also have written as Vivian Thorne, um, which is a Victorian erotic romance, um, and that's actually uh, the serial uh, that I've done. So be talking about that more than the Julia Kelly stuff, even though that's what my name says. <laughs> do you want us to call you Vivian tonight? Is that <laughs> oh, I, it's weird. I don't. I don't know how people do it when they change their first names for for pen names. I it's. I don't respond when people call me Vivian. It's very strange. <laughs> Except for Lexi, who likes to call me Lady, Lady Viv. I do. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and I'm Mary Chris Escobar, and I write. Um, women's fiction, lighthearted women's fiction, um, not serials at all, as I mentioned, so I'm excited to learn all about this tonight. Um, I guess to kick it off, oh, and I forgot, I'm drinking, I was so distracted by, like, you guys not liking pumpkin beer, I am drinking pumpkin <laughs> beer. <laughs> um, I have the Devil's Backbone uh, Pumpkin Hunter, so, and I did say fall ale, so Oktoberfest totally counts. <laughs> So I guess to kick it off, um, for people who are sort of new to the idea of cereals, um, because before talking to the two of you about it, I, I really wasn't super familiar with it. Um, Alexis, can you kind of give us an overview of what a cereal is? Like, what do we mean when we're talking about writing a story in serial format? Um, I think the biggest question I get is what's the difference between a series and a serial, because they sound so similar. And a series is series of books that either take place in the same time or are the same characters. A serial is different in that it, it is the same characters, but it's told, it's kind of one story told over multiple volumes. I always liken it to a television series where you have one arc over the course of an entire season or a half a season, and each episode tells a different part of the story. And so a serial really follows more of that format where it's episodic, and so each book installment that you get is exciting and it's new and it's fresh and it's one piece of a bigger puzzle that you're following. So could someone pick up a book in the middle of a serial and be okay? You or is that know. a difference between a serial and a series? Because a series I, thing you can pick up. Yeah, I, I personally I think that you're going to be totally lost because really what you're doing is is like Alexis talked about. It's a little like doing a long form. Um, prestige drama now where the, each episode builds on itself so maybe there's a contained story within the episode but then it's going to inform the actions of the characters so you're really getting the characters actions midway through their emotions all that build up um, and I, it's not it's not going to work I think quite as well as maybe the the self-contained in romance especially we do a lot of um, series with families and things like that so you could read you know the eldest sister's book uh, out of order um, if you know the books the series starts with the youngest brother's book um, and it wouldn't affect things too badly I, personally I think you would be rather lost um, if you jumped into the middle of one of one of Alexis's series or one of or serials or one of mine um, Maybe if you're feeling dangerous, you might, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. <laughs> I, I have a tendency to jump in in the middle of murder series um, and be totally lost for half the book, but that's kind of, for me, bizarre fun. So if you're <laughs> like me and you like to add extra mystery to a story that's not supposed to be there, you could jump in in the middle of a serial, but you would be really lost because there's no going back in a serial. You don't spend 
more than a line here and there reminding people of what happened before because you're supposed to be along for the ride the whole time. So we don't do a lot of that retelling. Got you. So kind of using the TV show analogy, there's not sort of a recap at the beginning of what happened the previous week. Like, like you're really not picking up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe a little, maybe but two, maybe a line. In the same way that you would get a, you know, if, if you mentioned somebody, I don't know, 75, 100 pages beforehand in a book, you might get a refresher of, oh, this is so-and-so's cousin. Apparently I'm big on family members today. Um, <laughs> but it's it's really more, the story is just going to keep driving forward and driving forward. Great. So when we're talking about a serial, what are we talking about as far as length? And, and length per segment and then also like how, how many um, installments are there usually in a serial? Does that very widely. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think Lexi is the person to really talk about this because she was the one who actually taught me what I started to do for my own serial. So I'm going to kick it over to her and put it all on her. <laughs> you go get food while I'm talking. Seriously. <laughs> if I pass out midway through, we're going to know what it is. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You should go get food. <laughs> At least a cracker or something. <laughs> Power bar. Eat a power bar. <laughs> I still have your power bars from RWA, by the way. If you guys doubted that we were friends, she just all her power bars. We're trying to mother hen Julia mid-show. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry about that. I was trying to send her food through my phone earlier. I was like, dear. <laughs> not working. <laughs> um, cereals, I think, just kind of by nature in, in indicate that it's going to be shorter. You're not reading novels when you're reading cereals. You're reading more bite-sized morsels. Um, and I generally like to think of my serials as something that you can read in an hour, just like you would if you were sitting down to watch a television show for an hour in the evening. Um, it's something that, it's bite-sized. You can take a break from your everyday life without necessarily getting, like me, when I pick up a novel, I can't put it down. And so I might lose three days of what should be my life because I can't stop reading a book. Um, I like the fifteen to 20,000 word novels, um, which I don't know what the page count comes out to mm -hmm. on that. Uh, about uh, 50, between like 45 and 55. Yeah, that sounds about right. So that, that's about 50 pages of reading. It's 15 to 20,000 words. It's something that you can read anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, depending on your personal reading speed. Um, but as you change, and that's romance. Romance is kind of a fast thing. It, as you change around in genres, you'll find that the length will vary a little. It, in certain areas of sci-fi, you can go as short as 10,000 words, and when you're in cer certain types of suspense, uh, mm -hmm. things can push, or even historical, they can push up toward 30,000 words per episode. It just really depends on your subgenre and your audience and the way that your storytelling arcs throughout each episode, because each episode really does have to have an arc to it. You're not just chopping up a longer novel into a few chapters here and there each episode has to have its own rhythm and its own arc and so what your arc storytelling feels like is going to dictate how long each piece is going to be. Definitely. Um, <laughs> anything you want to add to that, Julia, or does that pretty much cover it? You know, just that I went a little short on my first episode and, and I probably could have pushed it a little longer um, and, you know, now that that part of the book is free and so I don't feel so bad about it, um, which I know we're, we're going to get into pricing and free and all that in a little bit, um, but the further I got in, the uh, more the more I usually had to say, the only thing that I would... I would um, be careful with, and this will also come up in pricing, but basically making sure that what you're writing makes sense for your uh, for your reader satisfaction, uh, which is going to also have to be related to your um, the money you're making off of these, because presumably we do write to try to make a living, and um, you do have to take into consideration if you're writing for, for instance, what both of us write for, which is erotic romance, does it make sense to go through and write, you know, 25, 30,000 words and price it for 99 cents? Probably not. Um, you know, you're going to you're gonna probably want to stay within that 15 to 20 um, thousand word range because that's kind of the price point that your readership has gotten comfortable with for the first few parts of your of your serial and then we can talk later about kind of pricing out um, the back end of the book and how you kind of handle a lot of that. But for me, I felt like um, I was lucky the, the 
the pieces of the puzzle worked out in such a way that they were usually between actually almost almost always 18,000 words for some bizarre reason that was the sweet spot for me I think one went a little longer and one went a little shorter um, but but really that seemed to be a good a good place which was good because that fell kind of within my price point Great. exactly Great. <laughs> um, so I wanted to get into a little bit, um, definitely we want to talk about pricing and strategy, but in kind of defining what a serial is, um, I think Alexis you mentioned this a little bit, but can we talk a little bit about what it isn't? Because I think what I'm understanding is it's not taking a novel and splitting it up into parts. So can we talk a little bit about kind of maybe what a serial isn't? Because I think there's a lot of theories out there about how you can serialize things that maybe aren't staying true to the, the form. Okay. Uh, the biggest no-no is taking one novel and chopping it up into to smaller parts because that's a novel. And the, the storytelling for a novel is very different from the storytelling for a serial. I, mean, I structure my serials so that when I reach the end of my arc, they're approximately the same length as a full-length novel, but that has nothing to do to do with length as much as it is about pricing and marketing power, which is my reasoning behind that. Um, serials have a different pattern to them than a series. If you're chopping up a novel, then you're taking pieces of one larger complicated piece, whereas a serial is, is episodic, so it's little chunks and you may even change points of view depending on how you're writing your particular serial. So you'll have this one character telling it in this episode and a different character telling it in this episode, or you're seeing it from different points of view, um, and and it's really just really a driving force throughout the serial, as opposed to a novel which has three acts and it has an arc and you know the climax and the beginning and different parts to it. It's structured differently, even though your serial in five parts may come out to approximately ninety thousand words, so they're different. Yeah, no, that totally, that totally answers it. So, because I think the easy thought is like, you know, you're kind of doing the math on like you're going to have multiple parts and about fifteen to twenty thousand words, and like, could I just take this thing I've written and chop it up? And and that might not work because it's not, or it probably wouldn't work because it doesn't have that story arc in yeah. each part. Yeah, you know, I've seen people do it, and I've seen people do it with arguable success. Um, but I think that, I think that the thing you're going to lose with that is is what. Um, Alexis was touching on, it's structured differently, right? So if you think about it and you watch a TV show, so let's say I, I just watched the pilot of Quantico, which is sexy people in the FBI and one of them's a terrorist. It's very, very basic plotting. So basically you, you get introduced to all your characters in the first episode and you kind of build up some conflict, build up some conflict, and then there's this big overarching series long question which is who blew up Grand Central Station in New York City, which I take offense with by the way because it's one of my favorite buildings. Um, so who blew up Grand Central Station and they, you see this flash forward and they're pulling this um, you know, uh, Priyanka Chopra's uh, character into an FBI interrogation and all this stuff is going on, but basically, the, so you get this little bit of this little bit of, of a story um, that plays out when these guys are back in the FBI academy long before the terrorist attack happens, and so you get a storyline that arcs through it with one particular character, and you get a kind of a, some sort of resolution with that story, but it doesn't answer every question. So it's almost like you're unlock, unlocking these questions. So okay. you have this low, small question that's happening throughout the episode, and then you have the big story arc question. So by the end of that episode, by the end of that part of your serial, you've maybe answered that question that you kind of been stringing along throughout this one particular part, but what you're really doing is you're actually saying, okay, audience, you um, think that you know what's going on here, but I just threw something at you that's going to make you sit there and go, oh, but wait, what about that bigger question? And what about all these other questions I have? So now I have to watch the next episode. Now I have to read the next part of the serial. And that's the really powerful thing about serials, I think, in terms of audience and sucking people in, is you're kind of giving them just enough that you're really, people get excited because they have some sort of re re resolution with erotic romance often it happens through a sex scene although it doesn't have to uh, <laughs> doesn't have to uh, 
And so you get that little moment of, ah, but really in the back of your head you're like, yeah, but what about all this other stuff that's going on and how, are, how is she going to pull that off? And I think that's what keeps people threaded through. It's the little question and then it's the really big question. And while I think you can do that in novels, and I think people do, it's not necessarily structured in the same way where it's so easily digestible and so easy to split up. And I think that that would be my hesitation in telling somebody, yeah, go ahead. You, you, I mean, you can do whatever you want with your books, but that would be my hesitation in recommending to somebody, you should take a 100,000 word book that you just wrote, chop it into five parts, sell it off 20,000 words a pop and make all this money. Well, you know, people may not follow you through from part to part to part. You nailed, like, all of it with that explanation. That was so <laughs> perfect. All I need is a new Shonda Rhimes-like show and I can explain <laughs> serials. The, the other TV show that I really love to use as an example is Broad Church. Because you have the the the, mur the death at the very beginning of the series, and you don't find out the actual answers until the very last episode of that season. But every single episode gave you a little morsel of clues and what was happening and who couldn't be the bad guy and who could be the bad guy. And at the end of every episode, they gave you another little aha twist moment that made you turn on the next episode immediately and watch an entire series in one weekend. Not that I did that. <laughs> it's really good if you haven't seen it. Um, and I think that mystery and thriller are really excellent examples of kind of ways to hook readers through. I know we've done a first draft about hooking readers in your first chapters, but there are ways to continue hooking readers through your books. And some of them are more evil than others. I, I did an evil thing and I did grievous harm to somebody. She hates me for this. I did <laughs> grievous harm to somebody midway through the serial and I and the, the third book ends with yeah, it is the third book. I just had to I'd think about it for a second. Oh the that third one. Yeah, the third I don't thank you for the third, fourth one either. Yeah, sorry about that. The third book ends with this big moment of oh shit. Damn it. Okay, well I really hope she writes the fourth one really fast, <laughs> which I did. It's done, so you don't have to worry. But yeah, you know, if you want to look at a really good structure, look at, at successful mystery shows or look at successful mystery novels. Um, you know, those, those are a really good example of um, the way of planting those seeds and then kind of, you know, again, giving your reader a little bit of satisfaction but also some misdirection too so that you can get at that big question in the end. Great. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. I muted for a second and then couldn't remember if I had <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> um, just a little behind the scenes thing there. Um, so talking about, I mean, really the goal of the serial is to, much like a really great television show, kind of hook the reader in and have them keep coming back. So how long do you wait before releasing the next one? Because, you know, if, if you're going on that model of a television show, it's like every week you're getting a new episode and then you have that long break, you know, waiting for the new season. But, but so how often, how, I guess, you know, what is a recommended time frame or how long would maybe be too long? Like, would you lose readers if you let them go too long between installments? I think that's where serials get their biggest bad rap is people don't mind the little cliffhanger at the end of each episode, but when they have to wait, <laughs> <laughs> an extended period of time to find out what's going to happen next. They kind of send you evil eyes and hate mail. They don't want to read anymore either because th there's just too much between episodes. Um, some people do weekly. They write everything beforehand and then they re release the serial weekly. Um, some people do every two weeks and I've heard that that can be very successful. That's too fast for me. I like three weeks. Three weeks is a real nice sweet spot for me. It's a little less than once a month. So it's long enough that it's feasible. If you fall behind, you can still catch up as the writer. Um, but it's far enough apart, or it's close enough together. I'm sorry, the other way around. It's close enough together that it's not that long between episodes. Once you start going beyond a month per episode, the readers start to lose interest. They start to get frustrated. And, and so I don't recommend anything longer than six weeks. I would also think that would be a time frame that they would maybe just for forget. Forget, um, exactly. I, I know... <laughs> Uh, yes. The closest thing that I can compare this to sort of in my writing life is blogging, and I know the recommendation with blogging is that you blog at least monthly, because if you're not in front of people at least once a month, they're just going to forget. They might love what you're saying, but they're just, it's going to kind of run out of their mind and out of sight, out of mind. They're not going to remember to pick it up. 
Yeah, and I think that's the really dangerous thing. You don't want an abandoned serial, right? You you can understand people maybe not move, making it past book one because they say, you know, this isn't for me. But once people get into book two, three, four, they should be following you through. At that point, they're invested emotionally, they're invested intellectually, they're also invested with their money. They've put money towards this. And presumably, especially by book three, I think, you want to see people following through to the end. Um, for me, three weeks was also a nice sweet spot. Um, it felt way too long when I was ahead, and it felt way too short when I was behind. <laughs> um, and we can kind of talk about strategy um, a little bit more. The, one of the things that I tried to do to combat losing readers was to make sure that I had a buy link for the next book. Not necessarily the whole series, but the next book in the serial was active by the time it went to um, press. Can you go to press and <laughs> in the digital world? I don't know. By the time it became available for a release. So book one of The Lady Taken was... Um, up for pre-order and all that stuff, but book two was also before book one even released. Because I wanted people to be able to get to the end of book one and be like, well, I'm reading through, and click through, and I get a buy, and they get a pre-order. And I, you know, I didn't have massive pre-order numbers. It was, it was a brand new um, author name and all that stuff, brand new platform. But I did have pre-orders, and I do think those pre-orders are powerful. Um, the other thing that surprised me was I had a lot of pre-orders for the complete series um, that I boxed together. Um, it, it's not a... I guess it's a box set, but basically it's the length of a single title. Um, so the, the complete series bundled together. Um, I got a lot of click-throughs on that as soon as my book one went free. So it, I almost, it was almost like book one was a free sample for people. They could read it if they really wanted to know the story now. And uh, I think it I think it was about six weeks before, six or seven weeks before when it went free to when it actually came out in the box set. So I had already done one, two, and three and still needed to do four or five in, in the box set. Um, once that went free, uh, that first book went free, I did see a, a tick up in sales for um, that box set. So I do actually think that that's kind of a powerful tool. And I was surprised. You know, people, some people, and one of, one of our good friends, um, Alexander Houghton, looked at me and just went... I love you, I'm not buying it until, <laughs> until it's a complete thing. <laughs> and I will buy it when it's complete. And sure enough, she messaged me on the day that it actually, the whole thing released and said she had bought it. And it, I think it, it just depends on whether you've been burned in the past by an author who hasn't completed a serial, which having, you know, been a dedicated watcher of Firefly, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, it killed me that that series didn't continue, and it does. I think when a, when a book serial ends, because for whatever reason the author got busy, things happened, whatever it is, it's gut-wrenching because you don't get the rest of the story, you don't get the emo emotional satisfaction, the payoff, there's so many unanswered questions, same thing with TV shows, same thing with movie trilogies that don't happen, all this stuff, same idea. So I think, you know, people, some people want to see a commitment to the end and they want to make sure that you can actually finish it. I wanted to make sure that I could actually finish it, to be totally honest, because you are you are with this project for a long time, but it's also high stakes, right? So while you're writing a novel and you're sitting there and it's kind of quiet and only your friends know about it or whatever, even if you're on a contract, you can sit there and you can be like, well, I have to write this whole book, but nobody's going to see the story until it's done. Mm -hmm. And there is a different high stakes game that you're playing with writing a serial because you may not have laid down the elements that you need to complete your serial the way you think you want to in book one because you didn't anticipate this coming down the line. So I I respect and I totally understand why some people are just like, it's not for me, I'll read it in one form. And I think you've seen you've seen very powerful box set um, sales as well, right Lexi? Oh yeah, I, I have a very split reader base and I've been able to track it over all my different serials. Um, they're about 60-40. Um, forty percent of my reader base absolutely loves a serial. They love knowing that they have a new installment coming every three weeks that they get to look forward to. And probably about fifty to sixty percent of my reader base just wants the whole thing, or at least close to the whole thing. And so I, I can track the sales both. That's one of the cool things about serials is being able to track your sales numbers, and you can see who picks up a freebie and who reads two, and how that follows through to three, four, and five. And you can see how many of those people buy the the get the freebie and then go and buy the box set immediately. And it's really interesting to be able to track that kind of reader behavior, especially over multiple serials now. 
Um, so I can say that my, my reader base is pretty split between people who just want the freebie. It's a free sample. I like it. Okay, I will plop down three ninety nine or whatever it is you've priced your box set at, and I want the whole thing. Or you have people who pick it up and they just read one by one by one and like their little morsels one at a time. I don't know if you track this at all, but I mean, what, I, what I'm hearing is it's a trust issue. Like, an, yes, someone oh, who yeah. starts with the serial wants to trust that it's not going to get canceled in the middle. You're not going to, yes. you know, <laughs> you're going to finish it. Um, I, I don't know if you track this at all, uh, Lexi, but the first serial that you put out, mm -hmm. did you have more people buy that in small bites? And then once they sort of got to know you as an author, they're like, okay, no, like, she's reliably going to do this. I'm going to wait, and I'm just going to buy the box set. I don't know if there was if you notice that at all. I don't I don't know that I can quantify that. Yeah, yeah. But in theory, I, I would think that you might, the very first time you're doing something, you might get more people. Um, I, I definitely had, uh, I had a couple readers message me right away and say, I'm so excited for this serial. Let me know when the box set comes out because I just want to read it all in one chunk. And I have a lot of people who read along with me. They're like, great, the next one's out, awesome. Next one's out, awesome. Because they know that I'm going to put the next one out. I may lose a week or two here or there every once in a while, but the next one's coming out absolutely for sure. And that's why I always make it very clear from the beginning, this is a four-part serial. This is a five-part serial. It's supposed to be done by October. It's supposed to come out every three weeks. It is five parts. This is what you can expect. And I, I put forth my expectations and my, my goals and my structure, and they know what to expect from me. And when I don't deliver, they make... They're, they're very clear with me when I don't deliver. I've gotten a lot of email this week, which is awesome that I have people following my serial and they feel this strongly that they email me, but I feel really bad right now that I don't have this book out that's coming out on Friday because they want to read it and it should be out by now. Extenuating circumstances happen, guys. Authors get sick. Authors have family stuff go down. Things happen. We try. I promise. <laughs> That's my little like moment of please be nice to your authors. Yes. yes. And I think in that trust issue, and I think you know the way to develop that with readers. It, I mean, abs absolutely, things come up. And one thing I want to talk with you guys about is you know, like like you said, Julia, there's a huge kind of accountability piece and a little bit of like, if you haven't written it all before you start, like. Someone's waiting on the next part. Yeah. But I think, you know, connecting with the authors whose serials you like, connecting with them on social media, on Facebook or Twitter, they're going to let you know. They're going to put announcements on their website. Like, if, if something is coming and late, the author who wants to build your trust as a reader is, is going to address that and say, hey, like, I thought this was going to come out Monday. I've had the flu. <laughs> you know, so I think that's a good thing, you know, for readers of serials to be aware of. Make sure you're engaging with that author so you know <laughs> what's coming and if something has changed. And I think you guys both do a great job of saying, you know, this is where I am in writing the serial. This is when it's coming out. And if you have to move it, then you hopefully already have those channels out there to do that. And on the flip side, if you're an author who's sitting there saying, I'm going to be late on this thing, I'm going to be late on this thing, being a little bit transparent, you don't have to tell everything, but being right. a little bit transparent and saying, this is what's going on, you know, I, I'm not able to put this book out when I thought I was, I'm going to try to make a commitment to you guys to get it out as soon as possible and to get back on track, I think can be, um, can be a really a really powerful thing. Not everybody's nice, but I, I think the majority of romance readers just want their books, right? They just want great books from authors. And um, same in mystery and science fiction, whatever it is that you're um, that you're writing in. I, I think that people just are hungry for for good good content. And um, you know, it, it's it's use use the Facebook pages and, and the Twitter um, you know feeds and and newsletters are very powerful for this if something is going to be dramatically late and you really feel like I need to tell people there's going to be a multiple months delay or something like that you can let them know and um, you know some people might be annoyed but might be upset but I think for the most part people while they might keep, while they might keep you on the straight and narrow um, they just want your books. And, and that's really exciting because they want your books and, and that's not a position that everybody is necessarily in. And this kind of, not to interrupt, sorry. Oh. <laughs> this kind of feeds into my favorite part of writing serials and which is why I like to write serials is it's so much more interactive throughout the process with your readers. I, I like and I crave that interaction throughout the writing process that you don't get when you're writing a novel because like Julie was saying earlier, it's really quiet, only your close friends know what yeah. you're writing and what you're doing. 
um, I get really lonely during that part of the novel writing process, and I, and that's how I felt earlier this year after Lightning came out. I was like, lonely. I miss talking to my fans all the time and saying, hey, this fourth book is coming out. You won't believe what's happening next, and getting that interaction between them and the messages and the emails and the tweets and all that fun stuff. I think serials are really fun, so that's why I like to write them. And all I was going to say fits right along with that. When you're putting those buy links in the back of your books, make sure you're putting links to sign up for your newsletter and yeah. your social media links as well so that readers can engage in that way that it's maybe a little bit unique um, to a, a serial, definitely unique to a se like series or a serial where like they're invested in the characters and they want to see what happens next. So adding not only the buy link but the how to stay in touch with you, how to get updates from you in case there is something that you need to let them know. So tangentially, but I promise that it, it has a point. I was at the New York Public Library today doing research for my day job, um, and I was actually researching um, gentlemen's guides, which are which are guides to bordellos around New York. It's really interesting, and you could kind of map out where all the significant bordellos were. Like today, not like two hundred. No, years like ago. in in 1853. Okay, okay. Um, okay. But it was really like, interesting. So. I was holding this this or I was looking at this at this microfilm from 1853 and in the back of the microfilm it said for the latest edition of our guide drop us a note at this you know address and we will let you know when it's coming out and I was like they were doing back matter links to dirty books in 1853 <laughs> this is fantastic so you have no excuse that's what I'm saying you have no excuse for a way to make sure that your readers know what's coming up next, you know, you want to make sure that um, they have a way of getting in contact with you. So, whether it's you know newsletter, social media links, um, website, email, those are pretty basic. And then any if you if you're doing pre-orders, that's where your pre-orders go. You definitely want to make sure that that's pretty much the first thing that people see. And to speak to the power of a serial versus a novel. My, I ha every book of mine has a link to my newsletter in the front and the back of every book. My, and I have separate sign-up lists so I can track who's signing up from which sources. My novel series email list is uh, half as long as my serial email list. Um, I just I get immediate email sign-ups from my serial because people want that next edition. They want to stay in touch. It's, it really drives the newsletter sign-ups. Cool. So we've touched a little bit on pricing and definitely want to go back to that because I think that again is one of the unique things about serials. Um, one of the things that can be great for readers and also really great if you're writing serials, you know, as far as the price point for it. So can either one of you can kind of take the lead on this or, or start the question off, but how do you price a serial? Do you Always go I'm for kicking three. it over to Lexi again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm just putting so, it out there. She was the one who built my pricing strategy, and I can read. talk more about so it. So what's the strategy? On it. <laughs> uh, my, one of my other, other than the power of getting an email list built, um, is the ability to play with price that you have with the serial. Um, especially if you have no platform, which I think Julia got a little taste of. She had no platform for Vivian. Vivian. <laughs> Literally no platform, like did not have a reader, sign up, whatever. It didn't exist. Uh, well, serials give you that instantaneous backlist because all of a sudden you have multiple volumes that you're working with and you have a presence that you're constantly feeding and you have the ability to price multiple different volumes in all these different ways. And 99 cents is such an easy entry level point um, you can introduce somebody. If you have a great cover, you have a great blurb. It's just a really easy way to introduce someone um, to your serial and to keep them reading. Well, I really like that installment. I want to read the next one. Oh, it's 99 cents? I will do that. Thank you very much. And they keep reading. Um, and then once you get to the third volume in your series, you set that first one to free if that's something that you're interested in doing. And I highly recommend doing it because free is a very powerful tool for building reviews. For, um, for getting paid advertising because they like to see reviews. So if you don't have reviews, you can't get paid advertising. And, um, and just getting visibility for your serial because now all of a sudden you have a backlist because they buy that first buy, that first one for free. They pick up the next one for 99 cents. They pick up the next one for 99 cents and they keep on reading. And even after your series is done, you can you have five volumes to play with the price, raise it to $1.99, raise it to $2.99, play with your box set pricing. There's all these different things that you can work with now because you've written one serial. 
Yeah, and I, I'm going to elaborate on the free thing for a moment because that I, I saw the power of free <laughs> very immediately. <laughs> so basically, my book went. Um, I released volume three mid August um, or early August, I think it was August 14th. August 14th, and so I went through and I immediately set everything to free, and I went through and I did all the shenanigans you have to do in order to get Amazon to price drop, um, which was actually not difficult this time, and I was lucky because um, I had kind of a day, and you know I got you know a few a few more than I normally would in terms of sales, and then I got a few more than that, and then. And then one day I was looking at my phone, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I, I have KDP on my phone, and I looked at KDP, and I had sold 200 more copies than I normally, or sold, I, I had had 200 more downloads than I normally would. And I was like, huh, that's weird, I wonder if I hit some like weird Amazon algorithm or something like that. Throughout that day, I watched that number creep and creep, not creep, I watched it sprint and sprint and sprint up the clock to the point where I emailed you guys at about 9 o'clock, and I was just like, this thing happened, and what Lexi said is real, and everybody <laughs> should pay attention to what she says about cereals. And I emailed my, my sister, who's in um, a publishing program, graduate school program in, in Scotland, and I said, this ridiculous thing just happened. And of course, she's on a delay, so by the time she woke up the next morning, my numbers were... I can't even tell you the percentage jump that I had. I thousands, thousands more than I normally have in terms of downloads. And what it did, and what was very powerful, is it knocked my book right up to the um, top teens on its Amazon um, it, on its Amazon subgenre list. And I know some people think it's ridiculous when you 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 know you have your Amazon free romance, erotic romance, historical, Victorian, but it, the reality is if you are a user who is, if you're a reader who is yep. looking for a very specific thing, mine is a very specific thing. I am a very specific section of historical romance readers, historical, erotic, uh, Victorian, highwayman romance. That is going to get you directly to my book, and I saw a tick up in sales um, that has been steady throughout um, because I've stayed on that bestseller list um, throughout basically all of my books and that's when I really started to see a jump in pre-orders and that's when things really started to happen. Now I'll tell you that I uh, uploaded an update and foolishly didn't double check my iTunes um, upload, my iBooks upload and that set my, my free book back up to 99 cents on iBooks and then Amazon immediately shot my book back up to 99 cents so I saw a, st a very steep drop off in my downloads and my buys and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I looked at the, I looked at um, my page on Amazon, and sure enough, I was back up to 99. So I begged and pleaded, and basically sold my firstborn child to Amazon <laughs> to get my numbers back. And they did come back. They did not come back as strong um, in that crazy kind of Julia must have hit a Vivian must have hit an <laughs> algorithm somewhere. Um, but it was a, it was definitely a testament to the fact that you know I'm, I am still seeing straight readers going straight through and I'm seeing that not just on Amazon I'm seeing that on iBooks every single day I'm seeing that on Barnes & Noble every Barnes & Noble has been weirdly a quiet good seller for me and I I can't tell you why except that I did have a, a promo feature there one day and it seems like it's just it's gotten me high enough in whatever you know thing they use to measure their algorithm whatever's um, that I am selling books there. I'm selling books on Smashwords for the first time, which is really strange because I didn't know that people still bought books on Smashwords, but they do apparently, and I'm very happy about that because it's more money in the bank for me. So I I know that people, some people have a very difficult time giving their book away for free, but I see it more as investing in the rest of your book. So you're you've got your free, and then you you've got the rest of your books and the rest of your price points, which is why maybe instead of doing 99 cents for your last part, maybe you're doing 199, maybe you're doing 299, maybe you're playing around and seeing, you know, you want to make sure that you're still making money on this thing. So what what is the number that you need to hit in order to make this worth your while and how do you manipulate those prices? Definitely. Um, and to that end, with the box set, I'm just curious, I mean, is the idea generally, do you, like if you have five parts and one is free and the others are 99 cents each, just for example, do you then just say, hey, well, my box set is going to be 3.99, or do you just say it's going to be 4.99? What have you found with playing with that box set price? And that's where you're pricing. Am I getting an echo? I don't hear one. Mm -mm. Okay. 
awesome. It must just be my earphones. Um, and that's where playing with your prices comes in and why I usually recommend writing a five volume serial because five, especially when you're setting one to free, uh, allows you to still price your box set at a, at a price that will make you money, especially on Amazon where you want to make that 70% at $2.99 or above. Um, if you're doing all at 99 cents, you're going to be very close to hitting that 2.99 point because your first one is free. Um, if you're backing it up and you're putting your last one or your last two at a dollar 99 or more, it gives you a little bit more wiggle room because you want your box set to be priced a little bit more um, tantalizingly. Um, you know, if you buy each one, it's going to cost you six dollars, but if you get the box set, it's only four dollars. That kind of a thing. Um, so you get that. People get a rush when they get a deal on things, and you want them yeah. to make the entire series, and you want to make the most money that you can on them, um, because this has been your hard work all this time. You want to make your money back on all that work that you did. Um, so writing five volumes gives you the most wiggle room on finding that sweet spot for pricing things. I've actually played a lot with the pricing on tees over this last year, and it's been everywhere from 99 cents from every volume to up to two ninety nine for every volume, and I was charging four ninety nine for the box set, which I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm charging people this much money for something <laughs> that I wrote. Uh, but it worked really well for a period of time, um, and that, but the market fluctuates, and you have to be aware of the fluctuations in the market and work with the fluctuations in the market, and all of a sudden things weren't moving anymore, and when you see things not moving, evaluate, reprice, change things, play with things, do a sale, do something to re-spike up and re-energize people picking up your books and reading through them. Yeah, I just got a notice from, so I haven't played yet because I literally, my book went into a uh, box set on the first, so it's it hasn't even been a full week. Um, but uh, I do plan on playing with it. It's $4.99 right now. It's selling. I suspect it might be slightly high. Um, I probably will end up eventually bringing it down to three ninety nine, but I'm also willing to sit on it for a little bit and see what it's going to do because, again, I, I'm still having people reading through. I'm still having people download that free first. Um, the other thing is, you know, if if your box set is um, two ninety nine or above, you have some wiggle room to play with promotions. I got an email today from, or yesterday, from a, a distributor who shall not be named. I know who, um, I know who because I got the I email know. and I was like, I don't write in this genre. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, you know, I got an email from them basically saying, hey, you know, we're doing this big sale. We need books that are not currently 99 cents that you're willing to discount to 99 cents so we can go ahead and make this a big bestseller sale and we're going to go through and guess what? It happens to be historical. Um, so isn't that great, Julia? That is exactly what you write. And um, which is unusual because usually it's something like romantic suspense and I'm just like, I can't stretch this to be romantic <laughs> suspense. It's not happening. Um, so it gives you some opportunities to go in and do things like that. It gives you opportunities to run um, to run a sale and to note it on Facebook yep. and to you know run some Facebook ads saying you know for one week only get this book for ninety nine cents and then you can bring it back up to two ninety nine three ninety nine four ninety nine whatever. I think anything above forty nine four ninety nine looks a little high for romance right now. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, a long time ago, you know. Four ninety nine looked insane for a lot of stuff that was being published. So, um, you know, the market does fluctuate. The market changes. Since you are indie publishing, you are able to be flexible and nimble in a way that um, traditional authors can't be because they don't have control over their price points. So, um, and it's one of the big advantages to doing a serial as an indie author. Um, so, it's something to consider and something to look at and you know don't be afraid the reality is you're probably not going to do so much irreparable damage to your cereal once it gets going that you're gonna like completely screw yourself uh, once the things complete and you're working through you're probably fine so you know try it out be adventurous if you want to go into KU it's not for everybody but if you want to go into KU go into KU see what happens you know over those three months take advantage of some of the promo opportunities that are only kind of unlocked to you when you actually are in that program um, you never know what happens so, it, I think it's a lot like I've always said about novellas. They're good to play with. Like they're good to play with for free or changing the price or going into KU. Um, you know, just to see what would work. And there is a, a long writing time commitment, but it's kind of over a period of time, and you're writing it in short chunks. So it feels like you know something that you've definitely invested time in, but that it it's okay to play with that. 
a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I think there's definitely a psychological aspect on the pricing that in some ways I think allows you to go a little higher with a cereal. Again, if you've got these parts and they're 99 cents or $1.99 each, you can charge a fair amount for that box set and people are still going to feel like they're getting a good deal as long as it's just slightly lower than all the parts yeah. added up. I mean, I think we do that in our head. We're like, oh, okay, well, and if I bought all these individually, it would cost more. I have done that with every single serial I've ever read. I'm just going to be straight up front and be like, all right, so I'm sitting there. I'm an author, and I'm sitting there like, okay, 99 cents plus 99 cents plus 199 plus 2 I'm buying the box set. <laughs> like, right. just, yeah, you know, because it is. You, you get a, you know, 99 cents saved on Amazon is a whole book. So, you know. Definitely. And so that's a note. Uh, you know, if you're thinking about doing a serial, a, a don't would be like, don't, you know, price your box set less. Or, I mean, don't don't overprice it. Like, someone's going to go yeah. through and do that math. So <laughs> make sure yep. you're kind of pricing it to give people a little bit of a cut. Um, but that being said, depending on how many parts you have, you know, there could be a fair price of 6 or 7.99 if you've got 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 parts. <laughs> um, do that. Yeah, I, just, I just did the pricing yesterday or something because I thought for sure I was making more money on my box set, but I just changed all my prices a few weeks ago. And I was like, oh, there's only a 20 cent difference between if they're reading through my cereal piece by piece or if they're buying my box set. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Go for us. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a big difference. It's just psychologically you don't want it to like add oh, up. Yeah. 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 No, you're totally right. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. What else do I have on my list? Oh, we talked. You guys, you all have both talked a little bit about writing and how you write serials. And I know because I know both of you, but I just want to be really. You've seen all the blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> but there are there are I believe sort of two different ways to do this, and you all. You both fall in the camp of kind of writing as you go. I mean, you're a, you're a little bit ahead of where you need to be, but you're not writing the entire serial and then going back and releasing it. But there are sort of two ways to do it, yes. I would think. And so, can you talk a little bit about how you both do this? Like, kind of what your time frame? You know, how far ahead of the release dates do you write? Um, and whether you feel like that's the good way to do it, or maybe there's a better way to do it that would be less stressful for folks just getting started. <laughs> writing would be less stressful. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you can go first, Julia. Sure. So I um, was committed to three weeks, uh, every three weeks, once I started in uh, June 30th. So I started writing my serial around... Um, the first of May, and had everything wrapped up and thought, this is great. Like, I am in a great spot. And it, I, I will say that first book, it is a heavy lift. If you are completely starting an author platform and do not have a name for your author yet or anything like that, no Facebook, no social media, as opposed to what I did over the years, which was set up accounts as I was like, oh, you know, I really should have a Pinterest account. I did everything all at once, and it sucked. It just was terrible. Um, I will never launch another pen, another pen name again, which now that I've said that, watch, watch as it happens. Um, but basically, you know, so I was trying to at least establish enough of a presence that um, I, I had some stuff on Facebook that people could see and I had some stuff on Twitter so that when readers came it wasn't just a blank slate. Um, so I built that time in and once the book, so I started writing the second part in June and I was doing okay, was doing okay, was doing okay. First book launched, did a big lift on the, on the release day and was kind of in a good spot with the second book. I made a vast, vast miscalculation with the third with the third part. So second part released the Tuesday of RWA. Um, you were both with me as I sat there, as I kind of it dawned on me that I may not be able to release the third book on time, but I already had pre-orders set up, which is fine for some retailers. It is not fine for others. And I knew that Amazon was going to be my big um, retailer, and it was not fine for Amazon because Amazon does not want you to move a serial or a, a pre-order date back in time. You can move it up in time. You can make it earlier, but you don't want to. You don't want to piss Amazon off basically <laughs> by saying, "Ah, this book is going to be late," because they're saying you're making a commitment, so you're going to make a commitment, and they they lock you into it. If you don't make that commitment, you lose your privileges for a pre-order for a year. Um, it sucks. So. Um, I was very cruel, and I went home, I think that Monday, Tuesday, I finished the whole thing. I finished the reads and everything before I came to see you guys, and then 
I don't know how I would have done it without Lexi's husband and without Laura um, Von Holt and without Lexi because the three of them and, and Alyssa Cole managed to read that damn thing during RW... <laughs> Laura read it during RWA. <laughs> I don't know how she did that. Lexi's husband read it during RWA, and then the other two got it to me very, very shortly after RWA finished, and I literally was by the skin of my teeth. I didn't make one of my deadlines. Smashwords was not okay with me being late, um, but I, by the skin of my teeth, I got it in on Amazon, and I got it in on the other retailers, and I basically sent a bunch of emails being like, I am so sorry. I will never do that to you again. So this is the rule of you should be a book ahead in your serial if you are going to be writing by the seat of your pants. Even if you're a plotter, all those things, it, don't do what I did because there are unforeseen things or RWA, which is on my calendar now for next year, very foreseen, that you will run into to blocks with. Um, the other two parts were fine. The other two, you know, four and five, just got done. And actually I found out uh, I accepted an offer for a contract um, for a book deal that was going to have some very, very fast deadlines during <laughs> the writing of book five. So I basically accepted that, shook a bunch, um, was very excited, called my mother, and then went home that night uh, from work and finished book five and just like completely blew through the end of that book because it had to be off my plate. And you know what? It had to get done anyway. So it was a very interesting um, journey through realizing that you really can set your, yourself up for failure when you start one of these things. So you're going to have to make a commitment to your writing and to your reader and all of these things. Um, and, you know, again, things can derail your, your writing and, and things can, you can tell people, you know, this is going to be late. Um, but I didn't feel like I had a great excuse for being late, so I couldn't be late, basically. Um, so that's kind of my story, is if you're going to write it beforehand, please do yourself a favor, be one, be two books ahead of schedule, because something's going to, you know, derail it completely, and you're just going to end up sitting there like, why did I even start doing this thing? I'm a crazy person. And you do make a really good point um, that I think it's important for people to note about pre-orders. And if you are putting those pre-order links in the back and you're setting up pre-orders, the retailers yeah. do have some rules around that. So being really cognizant that cognizant of that, and you know, the deal the deal at Amazon. I mean, you don't want to screw that up and not be able to do pre-orders for a year. Not so. when your business structure depends on it. No. <laughs> right. Exactly. Not especially not when you're writing serials where you want people to click that pre-order button at the end. So um, yeah, just. There are, we talked earlier about the consequences with trust in your readers, <laughs> but there is also this very real sort of impact to your business if you're not hitting the deadlines that you set up with retailers. So yeah. good, good to know. I'm glad that came out. Yeah. <laughs> well, just because it's, it's good for people to know that there is a penalty. For not, yeah. Not I will admit it. Yeah. It's not fun. Yeah. 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 But you did it at Amazon. Yay. <laughs> just barely. <laughs> and it's not a good feeling. Like you don't want to have that. Like, ah, like what if it doesn't refresh? Or, yeah. I literally sat there during dinner, and I was just like, I think I'm screwed. I think I'm screwed. I think I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> what Julie doesn't realize is that we love to read a book in a night. So her, I just feel so guilty. Extra funny. So she sends so she sends sends us this email at RWA. Oh my god, I screwed up. I have to have this in. You guys need to read it. And Nate and I and our in our crazy we just looked at it and we're like, we have to read this tonight. Okay, cool. And so he starts reading. What are you doing? You're at RWA. That's how we operate. We're cool like that. <laughs> you are, and it was great. So we start reading, and we're reading, and we're reading, and we're reading. We have to go, like, to dinner with you two or whatever. And Julia's like, no, it's not. I asked you for a week from now. And we're like, dude, you gave us an entire week to read 18,000 words? <laughs> Which you just said. You could, you should be able to read about an hour or two. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will not say reading with critiques slows things down. It, but no, yeah. it to it to totally different. But, you know, at least four hours. No. <laughs> So we go back to our room that night, and I'm like, dude, we have a week. <laughs> like, I'm almost done. <laughs> yeah, and Nate's, like, lying on the bed when I come upstairs at one point, and he's just like, hey, I just sent it to you. And I was like, what? 
<laughs> They're very, very wonderful people. No, you never want to abuse your beta readers, right? You never want to kind of put somebody's plate, something on somebody's plate, and be like, "Here's a thousand or a ten thousand. Here is a hundred thousand word book that you need to read in five days." And you're just like, "What?" Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. That's true. That's that. That's cruel and unusual and fun yeah. punishment. I, did, yeah, I said fun. I did say fun. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So all of the advice Julia just gave you is really good advice, and I gave Julia all the advice. I I'm a mother. I have two children, and I live by the "do as I say, not as I do" rule. Right, that's all stuff she told me. I want to let you know, by the way, as she goes through and she breaks every single one of those rules. <laughs> I don't do anything I tell people to do. I didn't know this until this most recent serial because now I've been through it, and I'm just like, Lexi. <laughs> So we should have, in other words, we should have let Lexi go first so that you could no, end with, like, what you should do. Everything. <laughs> I intentionally had her go first so you would hear how you're supposed to do it. Right. So remember I that, tell, folks. Before I come in as the rebel teenager and tell you I don't do any of those things. <laughs> I feel so misled. misled. I, I, as I've been going through that email that I originally sent you. In several places, I say, you should do this. I don't do this. <laughs> no, that's true, actually. She did, she did give herself some wiggle room. Um, so I don't write ahead because I get kind of high on the rush of writing a serial. And so I like the last second deadlines and the mad dash to publication and the, oh my god, I don't know if I changed the hero's name in the middle of that book and were his eyes the right color. Um, they're no, all, no, they're never the right color. They're never the right color. Um, for the most part, I have had very few really bad infractions. Um, but basically, I'm a train wreck when I'm writing a serial. And I do that on purpose because I get a rush from doing that, and I apologize to anyone that this is upset, but it's my game, and I get to make all the rules. <laughs> um, no, I tried to be, um, for instance, right now, uh, book four in my ser my five book serial is coming out on Friday, and book five is already. I just hit my headphones and tried to whip myself, <laughs> um, and I don't even write BDSM. <laughs> Uh, but book five is already through a first draft, um, and I'm already sitting here doing revisions in my head. I try to have a first draft done by the time the next one is coming out. Um, I'm not a book ahead. It's not. It hasn't been read by the sexy editor. It hasn't been beta read. It hasn't been critiqued or proofed or anything. The crap I sent Julia a couple weeks ago is like vomit from my brain, and no one should ever read vomit from my brain. Um, but I try to stay a little bit ahead, but for the most part, I have found when I try to plan too much, um, when I get too planned, I lose all of the, the fun of writing the serial. So if you're a plan, and this is weird because I'm a plotter, I'm a super plotter, I have everything plotted out for the entire serial almost from day one, so I know exactly what I'm going to write. I don't know why I can't write ahead, I just can't. And my, my window ledge right here that you can't see, um, is actually the perfect length for plotting each book in my serial, and most of my serials are usually right around 20,000 words. Um, they're either 18 or 22, so 20 is the, the median. Um, I can plot the entire book right here on my windowsill, and at the end of each one, I wipe off my windowsill, and I put the new plot points down, and they're all in this notebook right here. Um, and that's how I write my serial, and I don't know why I can't write them a book ahead. <laughs> but you have them planned, I think, is what I mean. Like, you generally know where it's going. So, yeah. yes. Well, and the funny thing is, I did not have mine planned. I had kind of, I knew major points, and I could see major scenes in my head. Like, there's, there's this one particular scene with a ring and a chain, and I knew going into book one what that scene was. And I knew, you know, going into... Um, Going into the book, I, I was going to have to have, you know, a certain type of thing happen because it was a forced proximity romance, right? So they need to eventually get out of the forced proximity location. Um, so I knew I wanted to have these different elements, but I couldn't have told you what the filler was. And actually, that was one of the problems with book three, was I was sitting there like, oh, I, stuff they have sex like what else do you want from me I don't I will just write you 20,000 words of sex that is all this is going to be and it will just be like three days long and it's going to be fantastic don't worry about it guys and that's actually not 
a recommended way of writing a serial. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> even if you write some pretty hardcore erotica, you do need to eventually string some things in there like dialogue and plots. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah no, maybe. so it's, <laughs> yes, do it to me. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, you're, you are very much a plotter, and, and I have been in the past as well, um, reformed pantser, and, uh, so it just, you know, different approaches are, I think, can work equally well, and, you know, you're right, part of the excitement of, of serials is sitting there and being like, this is really fun, I get to learn, or I get to do this. Um, and have this publication along with the reader as well. And, uh, you know, things are, are moving along. So, you know, there are a whole bunch of different ways to do it, but um, I would recommend trying not to kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned more about me and my writing and changed my writing technique through writing serials um, than anything else I've written before. So it's a great place to, to learn and discover and make mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a great place to learn what your limits are in terms yes. of how much you can write. Like, if you can sit down, and uh, I am right now on a really fast uh, a book-in-a-month deadline, and I am going to hit this deadline, and I never would have told you that I would be able to do that before doing this serial, because now I know it's not exactly like, oh, you know, don't worry about it, whatever, like 40,000 words, fine, whatever. Um it's still going to be, it's still work and it's still moving along and, you know, I have to make sure and keep on top of myself, but it seems a lot less daunting having put out basically an 80,000 word book in two and a half months um, and doing all the edits on it while you're doing it and everything like that. So that really is helpful and it kind of, it, if anything, it's a fun challenge and I, I think that at some point, even if you end up hating it by the end of it, it's something that I would recommend authors do because you never know. I mean, like you said, you learn a lot about yourself when you're writing one of these things. It's kind of like NaNoWriMo for prose. Yeah. <laughs> it's even more NaNoWriMo than NaNoWriMo. One. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Where people are actually going to read it and waiting for it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you also need to edit the thing and market the thing. And right. Yeah. So when you're planning that timeline, you know, whether whether you're going to kind of pants it or plan it out, or be a book ahead, you have to plan in not just the writing time, but you have to plan in uh, time for editing and time for yes. formatting, you know, getting time the for your format. beta readers to read at a national conference that happens once a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially when you're indie, you're doing everything. This is book covers, marketing, formatting, uploading, blurbing. You're blurbing for five books. Oh, it sucks. <laughs> I just gave up at the end. I'm totally 100% honest. I need to go back and rewrite my blurbs because the end yeah. is like the conclusion to the passionate love story of these two people. It's like Yay. worse than the TV Guide little blurb. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will warn you, one thing you need to be really careful about is it takes a ridiculously long time to update the back matter for um, 25 books. Uh, 30 yeah. if you are... Um, well, if so if you're doing to all the individual retailers, I did five, I think. So I have five, five. So it's I probably did back matter updates for 30, 35 books at some point. And at some point around book three, I, or about around book four, I was like, screw it, I'm putting pre-order links in for everything in the back, and they can just deal with it. And so all I had to do was update the, um, take out the, you know, you can get the next book here um, link, and, you know, on this date, and then do the update. But it takes a long time. Yep. And so I watched a lot of episodes of Parks and Rec yep. while I was formatting. It sucks. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and there's ways to, like, make that slightly shorter if you want to go through yeah. an aggregator. Um, but, again, totally up to you, and you often make more money by not doing that. Yeah. Just and you know what's also fun is realizing midway, like midway through doing your box sets that you can actually duplicate your Scrivener files. Right. Yep. Didn't know that. Didn't Learning all sorts of things about Scrivener. I went through and I made individual files for every single thing oh. I wanted to shoot myself. It sucked. <laughs> you can also take your EPUBs from some sites and put them on other sites and edit them there. Yes. Don't tell I, me have, I now have a Scrivener file that's just my back matter for each retailer, that's and really I just smart. I just up I just did this in the last two weeks because I just got Scrivener for Mac because um, I've had it on PC and PC sucks, um, and so I just I just keep my back matter updated and but this is the thing that that she's trying to say is when you've written a five book serial that's right. five books 
across Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, Smashwords, ARE, every retailer you do, you yep. have to update all five books at all every single retailer. And so if you're like me and this is your third serial, um, that's 15 books plus box sets plus your I regular novels. I don't update back matter unless I have to now because I want to shoot myself. Well, I imagine <laughs> it makes more sense for you to do it like at the very end of a, of a you run to the end of Tempt yeah. and you'll do the whole sweep of back matter and you'll spend exactly. like two days doing it and it sucks. Yes. There, yeah. And that's where maintenance days are built in. You're updating your website, you're updating your Facebook page because your metadata there is important on all the pictures you weren't thinking about what you were posting and then your back matter and blah. <laughs> so much. So building that time in. And the front, on the front side, uh, you touched on this, Julia, but building in, like if you are brand new and just starting, building in time to set up a Facebook page for, as an author and, you know, or if you're writing under a brand new pen name, you know, there's some time involved in setting all those things up, which a lot of us have done kind of, like you were mentioning, very organically, like as yeah. Pinterest got popular, we added ourselves to that. Not me, I never did, but you know, but you know, we kind of did those things. Um, that was a terrible example. Um, when Instagram <laughs> became popular, we added ourselves to that. Yes. But like, you don't think about the t length of time to go like set yourself up on all of those in one sitting because you've never done it that way, more than likely. Yeah, it sucks, but it's worth it. That's right. The, that's what it really boils down to. And it also makes you sit there and prioritize. You've got to, you know, you've got to sit there and say to yourself, do I really need to have a separate Tumblr for this? Yes, I do because it's part of the brand. Okay, let me do that. Do I need to have a separate Instagram? No. Okay, let's go ahead and, you know, we'll X that one off the list for now. Right. Um, and we've talked about social media before um, in first drafts as well. But, um, yeah, it, it does make you sit there and think to yourself, okay, what are you going to do here? Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's a fun, fun thing. But in, in the end, it means that you're more reachable by readers, and that's always a good thing. And um, it's, yeah, definitely. It seems like the hallmark of the serial is this connection with the reader. Yes. And so... In this, perhaps more important than if you're starting out brand new with a novel or a series, you know, you do want to have all those things, but maybe the website is the most important. But yeah. with a serial where you're wanting people to interact, you do need probably one or two social media sites set up to allow and a them newsletter. to do that. And a newsletter, yeah. Yep. Newsletter should be first thing, yeah, really. Definitely. Yeah, so if nothing else, there needs to be a link to that newsletter um, in the back of your book. Sure. Yep. Well, we are good on time. Uh, it's such an interesting topic, and we can um, we can talk and talk and talk and talk. Um, but we are at our hour mark, so definitely want to um, wrap up here. So, if I could maybe have each of you just kind of give like, what would your advice be? Your just one piece of advice to anybody who wants to start writing a serial. If you've got kind of one thing you can sum up um, from the conversation that you would tell somebody. Um, the thing, the thing I always tell everybody, it, it, it's my best piece of advice is serials are at, are episodes, so study up on all your favorite authors and television shows um, that that tell stories in an episodic format and look at how they they structure each episode and how each thing has a rhythm and become an expert at thinking and feeling and that kind of a rhythm and that will become natural in your writing so that each one of your serial episodes is its own little arc inside of a much bigger arc and so it's a satisfying tale because at the end of the day what you're doing with a serial is you're entertaining an audience in an interesting way and you want to you want to deliver on that. Yeah, I, th I think that's really smart advice and you know building off of what we were talking before I think uh, be realistic with yourself about what your writing style is like about how fast you write. If, if you really need to have something complete and done and ready to go, um, maybe if you're a, a pantser more than a plotter, you know, do that and commit to that. But also be realistic, um, you know, with your readers. And if it's something where, you know, you're writing along and, and something happens, they, they just want to know. They want to know when you're, they're going to get your next book. And um, as, you know, Frustrating as I'm sure that can be when, when something really big is happening that's derailing your writing. Um, you're building loyalty, you're building trust, and I think that, that the best way to do that in those situations, if you haven't, you know, planned for, you know, whatever crisis has come up, 
uh, is to let them know. And, and again, you don't have to say anything you don't want to say. You can be as transparent as you want to be about what it is that's holding up your writing um, if that happens. But um, you know, you're building a relationship that hopefully will carry through for the rest of your career, whether you continue writing serials or whether you go in and write you know, novels or novellas or short stories, whatever it is that you write. Um, but I do think that you know, being realistic about your own writing is, is helpful. And I also think that you know you should try it. Why not? You know, um, it's it's another form of uh, books that can get in the hands of your readers and can be really exciting and it can invigorate your own writing. So um, I'd say give it a shot. Awesome. Thanks. And we'll just really quickly go around and promo um, anything that you want to let everyone know about before we sign off. So we'll go back and start with you, um, Alexis. <laughs> Um, so this was my very first serial. It's tease. You can read the whole thing. Um, this is my current one, Tempt, and this is this is Theo. He's hot and sexy. Book four comes out this Friday, and book five will be out in two weeks. I normally do a three-week cycle, but because I fell a little bit behind, four and five are coming out in a two-week cycle to help make up for the lag in things, and the box out will be out right after that. It's sexy. It's hot. It's fun. It's suspenseful. There's really fun. things happening in four and five that I can't believe I wrote. So. <laughs> it's really so, exciting, guys. So now you have to get them to find out what those are. <laughs> Start with one now. <laughs> yeah. It's free, and one is free right now. It went free uh, like a week ago, and it was the Cosmo, uh, Cosmopolitan.com yes. that excerpt last week. So, <laughs> yay! Lots of good attention. All right, go ahead, Julia. So um, has Vivian Thorne. I need like different hats to signify which person <laughs> I am. Right a now. Victorian hat for Vivian. <laughs> I do. I have a fascinator I can wear. Um, so as <laughs> if I could reach it, I would. Um, as Vivian Thorne, uh, the last book in uh, my The Lady Taken series came out um, at the very end of September, and the first. Uh, the the box set of the series uh, of the serial came out um, October first, which is very exciting. So again, you know that was last uh, last week, and I'm really thrilled to have that behind me and done, and to be looking forward and looking ahead to doing the next one, which is undetermined time because I haven't figured out when I can do that. Uh, because uh, as Julia Kelly, other hat, uh, <laughs> which is also Victorian, uh, I actually um, am very happy about. Um, now being able to talk about working with Pocket Star, who just um, bought three of my books, um, which are set in the 1850s, uh, about governesses, and I am currently writing book two, uh, which is due very soon, um, and it's going to make it, and it's going to make it ahead of time, because I've decided it's going to make it in ahead of time. Um, but uh, that's really thrilling, and I'm, I'm really excited to get you know dug in with my with my editor and get moving on those, and those should be out sometime next year, so hopefully I'll be able to give more solid dates at some point, but um, there's a lot to celebrate, wrapping up a serial and starting something new and exciting. So um, I'm going to kick it over to Mary Chris Escobar, <laughs> who is our wonderful host through this whole thing. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I am semi-feeling inspired to write a serial. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and I know where to go if I need help with that. Um, but really exciting news. Um, great. Let's see, what do I want to promo? I will promo, since we talked so much about um, email lists and newsletters, I actually have a free uh, novella available when you sign up for my newsletter that I send out every week, um, which is little snippets of kind of what's going on with me and um, interesting things I find around the internet. So um, it's a great way to stay in touch, and you get a free novella called How to Fall, um, which is a beach story. So for those of you that live in colder climates and it's starting to get cooler um, for fall, it's really fun to pick up a beach read this time of year. Um, and then also I have a promo coming out with um, my novel Never Ending Beginnings with Midlist on the 23rd of uh, October. So if you're not familiar with Midlist, it's a mailing service that you can join that sends lots of books that you would be interested uh, in that are on sale into your inbox. So if that sounds good to you, you might want to look into that and sign up and you can look for my novel Never Ending Beginnings on sale for $2.99. Um, on the 23rd of this month. So, Woo! Yay! <laughs> um, so thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, we've given you lots of information about cereals. I am sure that 
um, Alexis and Julia would not mind if you reach out to them on social media. Look at Alexis's website. She's doing a uh, that's right. blog post yes. about cereals. She's doing a cereal on cereals. Yes, <laughs> so go to alexisannbooks.com and um, subscribe to her blog and to her newsletter um, and watch for those posts on cereals um, to get a lot of what we talked about tonight. Um, written out for you in nice blog <laughs> format. Um, and also um, check back on our website. We'll have a replay of this as well as a podcast um, because I know there's a lot of good information here for people who might be thinking about getting started on cereals and you might want to rewind and listen to some of the great advice again. So um, thanks ladies for sharing your expertise and thank all of you who watched um, for watching tonight. Cheers whether you like pumpkin beer or not. <laughs> good night. <laughs> good night.